firm. And here with me today is super attorney of law himself, attorney Rick Dodd. Rick, how's it going? Oh, it's great today. I'm happy to be here. Hope everybody's enjoying the day. It's always a pleasure to have either you or Ross on. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, 254-697-6633 if you want to be part of the show. Um, Rick, what I'm going to do is I'm going to preface this segment by going over the LTC aspect of it, and then we're going to get into your expertise on what we're going to be talking about. And ladies and gentlemen, what it is, um, I teach guns, tactics, scenarios, body language, everything to defend yourself when the time arises. But here's a twist. What if, what if we can avoid the whole situation altogether, or maybe seeing a situation starting to brew, we can de-escalate it? That would save us a whole lot of unwanted consequences. And what I'm talking about is nonviolent dispute resolution. One of the lessons to learn when learning nonviolent dispute resolution is the understanding of ego states. There are three, and we all have them. It just depends on what happens to us and how we respond to a situation which determines which ego state will be present. Those three ego states are parental, adult, and child ego states. The scary thing is that a person can shift from one ego state to another in the same sentence. So being good students and learning how ego states work, we can better direct a potentially dangerous situation into a nonviolent disagreement. All of us see this happening on a daily basis with other people all around us, and even ourselves. All we did right now is just put scientific terms on what we already know. Now that I have uh, you know, somewhat set up this section, let's, I'm going to go to uh, Attorney Rick Dodd here in a second, but what I want to do is read three paragraphs, three short paragraphs to get you lined up for what we're talking about here. And this is about the parent, adult, and child ego states. This is from our training manual. It says, Observation of spontaneous social activity reveals that from time to time, people show noticeable changes in posture, viewpoint, voice, vocabulary, and other aspects of behavior. These behavioral changes are often accompanied by a shift in feeling. In a given individual, a certain set of behavior pattern, patterns often corresponds to one state of mind, while another set is related to a different psychic attitude, often inconsistent with the first. These changes and differences give rise to the idea of ego states. So in technical language, an ego state may be described as a system of feelings accompanied by a related set of behavior patterns. The position is then, and this is an important paragraph, a very short one. The position is then that at any given moment, each individual in a social situation will exhibit a parental, adult, or child ego state, and this sentence is even more important than the whole thing, in that individuals can shift with varying degrees of readiness from one ego state to another. Okay, so the observation gives rise to certain diagnostic statements, which I'm not going to go into, but this is your parent, this is your adult, this is your child, all have special meanings. So, Super Attorney Rick Dodd, again, welcome to the show. You're the expert, and we're going to be so glad to listen to your expertise and breaking it down and telling us what this is all about. Well, first, when we talk about uh, expertise, uh, I uh, sometimes can be at a party, and if I tell someone I'm a trial lawyer, you know, they'll they'll sort of move away from me like they did in uh, Alice's restaurant. But if I tell them I'm an expert on conflict resolution, suddenly they all gather around <laughs> want to be part of the group. And then really that's what I do. It's like uh, Warren Zevon says, uh, lawyers, guns, and money. You know, those are the three things that help us get out of conflicts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're rolling today. Okay, go. <laughs> so that's what it takes. Uh, and of course, what you just read, sort of tracks what Sigmund Freud wrote back in like 1920 when he started uh, breaking down the id, the superego, and the ego. It has to do with with our childlike uh, uh, desires to get whatever we want to get by acting the way we thought we would act as a child. And then our id, which is, is the it, which uh, really is, is a subconscious thing that, that, that occurs just because we want what we want and for no other reason. The superego is something that we learn basically from our parents about how to interact in, in uh, society. So this is exactly what you're talking about. Uh, as far as breaking it down goes, what, first let's, let's, let's kind of think about how that uh, applies to what we're here talking about today, guns. Okay. Uh, 
a classic example, I think, would be some of the fellows that, that are in the NFL. We hear a lot about guys in the NFL getting shot. Uh, we hear about road rage situation where, you know, the big guy that's been in the NFL who is used to getting his way because of his physicality getting shot because he doesn't use some of the conflict resolution concepts and ideas to defuse the situation. Instead, he comes on like a child, barrels his way into the situation and winds up taking a bullet because the other person sees him as a threat to their physical physicality and uses part of the lawyer's guns and monies to end this conflict. So, like one example would have been uh, Will Smith. I think he was with uh, New Orleans back in, uh, oh, it's just been about a year ago, where uh, there was a traffic wreck, an altercation, and he wound up being killed because he didn't really think about the way to defuse. In fact, he actually uh, threw gasoline on the fire, so to speak. These guys, like rappers, you know, we hear about different rappers getting killed. They, they have the same concept of self. In other words, that I'm going to get this because they're, they're used to it. it it's the, the, it's kind of like the jury and the cars, you know, guns become part of their society. And uh, you have to be aware of that and, and be concerned with that if you're going to make it through a tight situation. So instead of acting like a child and barreling the way through it, what you need to do is act more like an adult, and that is to listen to what the other person is saying. And of course, there's all sorts of things out there that, that can take you away from that listening, uh, like outside interference where you have noise. Uh, and traffic situations are a lot like that because you got the cars passing by, you have to be concerned about getting ran over on the highway. So one of the things you really ought to try to do is get out of the way, get out of the highway, get, get off to the side so that you don't get ran over, so you're not worried about something else beside what the other person is saying if they are in an agitated situation. Uh, so you can listen, and, and then try to, uh, after you've heard what they had to say, try to repeat it so that not only you understand what they're saying, but so that they understand that you understand. In other words, that you're showing an appreciation for what they're saying. Not necessarily that you have to agree with what they're saying, but at least you're showing an appreciation by repeating something like, well, gosh, as I understand it, what you're telling me is. And, and not only does that give that appreciation, but it sort of gives them a little bit of time to calm down as opposed to pointing the finger and saying, well, blah, 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 you did this and you did that and you shouldn't have done that. That's more of a childlike answer to it. Rick, I want to make a comment about that. You know, as you're talking here, because I'm studied on this and I have to teach this, I teach it to a lot of people who may not be familiar with the types of terms that we're talking about. They live it, they experience it, but they don't really know what's going on until we explain it and break it down. But what's interesting is you're talking my language. I know what you're saying. And what's interesting is if you and I are talking, because we understand each other and we understand those basic concepts of ego states and all that, it's almost like we can have a very civilized conversation because we can see oh didn't mean to go that way sorry let's come, let's back it off or whatever and if everybody understands that and knows that and hopefully they will after this segment or to some degree it'll make it easier for conversation and, and things to get along i just found that fascinating sure absolutely and and you know it's not just this conversation but it wouldn't be a bad idea to uh you know take a course in it dale carnegie i think uh, uh does a great course in this sort of thing. And of course, we haven't had Dale Carnegie in camera for a while, but I, I was able to take it. Uh, our, our industrial foundation set up a, a class. So if that comes back to Cameron, and hopefully it will soon, I might even take it again because it's been 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, Warren Buffett, believe it or not, who has degrees from some major university, has his Dale Carnegie certificate front and center on his wall. He says that's the certificate that he believes was responsible for his success more than any other certificate or more than any other training. And I found that to be fascinating. Uh, but, you know, these, these are not magical terms and these are not magical thoughts. You know, we, we want to hear about... They're, they're basically facts. They, they are. They, they are. happen. Yeah. You know, and we put these terms on, like you said, the id, the superego, the ego. I think, uh, Bernie, the stuff you were uh, quoting really simplifies it more than than uh, than uh, Sigmund Freud did uh, so 
again, it's, it's, it's just a situation where you have to act like an adult. And you have to consider or concern yourself with the other person's needs, wants, and desires, not just yours. Because, again, that's more of a childlike right. response. A lot of body language comes into this, too. As you're, If you learn body language and you understand these terms and the ego states, in the course of the conversation, I made a comment about how that one sentence was extremely important and says that individuals can shift with varying degrees of readiness from one ego state to another. You can be in a conversation and in midstream, all of a sudden, you may have said something that the other person found offensive, unbeknownst to you, but watching the body language, <clears throat> they don't have to say a word to you, but their body language of maybe canting off to you, blading off to you, crossing their arms, um, staring at you, it's like, oh. So the combination of body language with learning these ego states can really help you prevent getting in an altercation and, and reduce the possibility of that happening. Sure. And, you know, that's all, it's all about paying attention. Uh, if you pay attention not only to their body language, which is you know, obvious, we all exhibit certain body languages depending on our emotions and our feelings, but you also have to be a good listener. You have to pay attention to what the other person is saying. In other words, if you don't listen and you don't hear what they're saying, repeat what they're saying, what you're doing instead is you're mouthing off and you're talking, and that's all about the I, the me, the id part. Let me give you an illustration. In, in my class, we talk about this, or I talk about this, where you know how in, in the course of your life somebody's asked you a question and you kind of caught part of it and you assumed it's what they said was this and your answer was responding to them what you thought they said and it was a close enough answer or what they told you was a close enough answer to what you needed to make you go in the direction you thought you had to go. And then you ask another question, and it was still a little skewed. It wasn't 100% accurate, and it makes you go off course just a little bit more. And all of a sudden, before you know it's like, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. What do you think I asked you originally? And then the person says, uh, you asked me this. I go, no, I didn't ask you that at all. It's because I spoke, you heard, but you didn't send it back to me for confirmation, and it's potential for escalation of conflict. It happens all the time. If you're married, it happens all the time. Go oh, ahead. yeah. They, they, there's a little deal that we used to do in, uh, back at Ada Henderson in like the fifth grade. We'd sit around in a circle, about 15 people, and the deal was that one person whispered into the next person's ear, and then you weren't allowed to repeat it. But you, they would go around and almost always that 15th person, what they said was just different. I use that example person. in my class too, what you're doing. I say the first, first person out of 100, your mother's beautiful, she smells like a rose. And by the time the hundredth person comes out, she's a battle axe and smells like an old shoe. I'm like, how does that happen in the course of a hundred people? That easy statement where it gets changed like that. I got a question. Hey, Trey, get ready for a one minute break, okay? Um, here's the question. How important, Rick, when it comes to the courtroom, are ego states when it, when it comes to um, getting a conviction or not? And why? Well... You know, when you talk about getting a conviction, uh, you know, you have a lot of players in the courtroom. And, of course, the most important player in the courtroom is the jury. And their job is to sit with their mouth closed and their ears open and try to hear all the evidence. Now, in order for them to get all that evidence, the lawyer whose job is to give them that evidence in a fashion such that they can take it in and... and, and catalog it and classify it, he has to also be care very careful about what he does as far as listening to the evidence and assimilating the evidence. Uh, if you're not listening to the witnesses on the witness stand and you're a lawyer and you're sitting there looking at the bluebird out the window, you're not doing your job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so yeah, it's, it's very important for everyone in the courtroom to listen carefully and keep their cool. I've seen some lawyers bust out and get angry. You know, because it is a high-tension situation, sort of like a, a traffic wreck might be, and you can't afford really to get angry. It's, it, you, you, those emotions take away from that ability to listen and understand what's going on. It's just as important to understand what's going on on the other side of the aisle as it is to understand what's going on, on your side of the aisle in order to be successful in the courtroom. So if I'm talking in an adult manner and I know if I say something, I'm going to get somebody from an adult to a, a parental child, almost in a courtroom, that could be advantageous for 
uh, if you're trying to get emotion stirred, yeah, you know how to trigger somebody, right? Oh, it happens all the time, and of course, <laughs> you know, we look for that. Uh, most of the time, as lawyers, when we're doing depositions, that's all pre-trial. We are communicating with the other lawyers, and uh, I learned that early on because I saw some of the old cats doing it to me. Uh, you know, they would push my button, and I, I, I'm like, well, how did that happen after afterwards? And then I realized, ah. Oh, They've been doing this for 35 years. <laughs> <laughs> now you have, and now you know what buttons to push, right? That's right. All right, let's take a quick break, Trey. We'll see you on the other side. It's uh, Aaron's High Cap Adventure Radio Program, and today's June 17th. We'll be back in a minute or two. Welcome back, everybody, to the Aaron's High Cap Adventure Radio Program. Again, it's June 17th, 2017, and I'm here with Super Attorney Rick Dodd, and we're going over ego states. Ego states are very important to know, understand, and learn to help de-escalate, to have non-violent dispute resolution. If you're a licensed to carry holder, this is one of the segments you're going to go over. You're going to sign affidavits that you learned, laws pertaining to the state of Texas for license to carry. This is part of it, the things that you need to know. You get tested on this. And of course, with my excellent teaching, you'll learn it no problem whatsoever. Okay. Uh, now, Rick, we were talking at the break here. We we're going to go over again which one, what each one is, and maybe give a couple examples of how it can go south real fast, and then maybe once it goes south, how we can get it back to a level playing field. Well, you, you were talking about like uh, we were talking about poor listening, of course. Uh, if you are in a, a tight situation and you don't hear the other person or choose not to hear the other person, and instead continue to be accusatory, like you should have and you didn't and why didn't you it's you know it's sort of like a, an argument in a marriage i mean you got to be a good listener and you have to be able to diffuse the situation otherwise things are just going to escalate and when things escalate out in a situation where someone uh, might be having a, a a gun and willing to use it if they get really upset in their childlike uh, state you might be uh, no longer with us. So it's important to have those listening skills and uh, and hear what the other person is saying. So the way things can go south is if you don't and the other person escalates into a situation of using their physicality as I was talking about some of the football players might do, some of the, uh, and when I say some, I mean some, uh, some of the uh, rappers might do in situations where things uh, aren't going their way and their childlike attitudes comes out you know Rick in my class when I'm teaching license to carry we have been so uh, I guess neutered in the sense of how much time I've got to give all this information so I've got to be very dramatic in my teachings and when we're going over ego states to illustrate the first one parental out of nowhere I'll tell somebody who I know in the course of the class has been pretty cool you know he's laid back I can get a good feel for how this individual is I'll say you need to shut up and sit down and do it right now and the person just looks at me and everybody's looking at me and I go that ladies and gentlemen is a parental ego state how do you think the student responded to that kind of bucked up looked up and said hey well, wait a minute here what's going on that's immediate conflict right there and then I also show the example of how okay now ladies and gentlemen watch I'm going to say, hey, pal, I'm sorry. That was really rude of me. I didn't mean to do that. I don't know where it came from. I'm having a rough day. Uh, please forgive me. I hope you accept my apology. And what's happening there is I'm taking it from a parent-child um, paradigm. Would that be a great way to say it? Sure. And I'm, I'm leveling it back out on the scale there to adult to adult. Because if you're not speaking adult to adult, you got conflict. Yeah, the child's going to come out and say, hey, you know, that's none of your business. I'm going to do this because... I want to do this. That's right. In other words, up here. <laughs> okay, and then the uh, it goes just the other way too. If you're acting childlike, and the person's going to come back at your parental. So when you're when you're talking to somebody, watching the body language, understanding these ego states, you can have a communication that's much better. So let's say, what if you walk up on a situation that you're not even involved in, non-violent dispute resolution? You're going to come in there and trying to to balance everybody out. What would be a good way to do something like that? Same method. Same method, yeah, again, you have to be a good listener, to find out basically who's doing what. And of course, you know, depending on the uh, elevation of the conflict, you have to be more careful. You know, if, if uh, they're already drawing their guns on each other, it might be best just to step back a couple of steps. Yeah, I'm always talking about, I ask people <laughs> in my class who does pot, and I tell them I do pot every day. 
pot's a very important aspect of my life. And if I don't do pot, I'm really messed up. And pot stands for perception of threat. Pot. And they'll all go, ha, 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 funny, funny, funny. Absolutely. Don't, don't quit your day job, right? But <laughs> perception of threat is very important. So when you're coming into it, what's the perception of threat? How do I come in on this thing? And the, the best way to do it is in a nonviolent dispute resolution mode, which is an adult mode. And uh, we need to go over that definition again. Adult. Adult is. I have no idea where adult is. Where do you go? Well, adult person, basically what that means is someone who can step in and listen carefully, not be distracted, hear what's going on, and talk to people as other adults, as opposed to talking to other people like they're your child, or conversely, talking to the other people like they're your parents, or acting as a parent. Let me read, to, the reason I hesitate, I wanted to read what it said out of the manual here, just so everybody's on the same sheet of music. I'll read the three, this parent, adult, child. It says, this is your parent means that you're in the same state of, and you, you touched on this, that you're in the same state of mind as one of your parents used to be, and you're responding as he or she would with the same posture, gestures, vocabulary, feelings, etc. This is your adult means that you've just made an objective appraisal of the situation and are using the thought processes or the problems you perceive or the conclusions you have come to in a non-prejudicial manner. This is your child means that your reaction is the same as it would have been if you were a little boy or a girl. It also says here the implications are every individual has had parents or substitute parents and that he or she carries within themselves a set of ego states that reproduce the ego states of those parents as he or she perceived them and that, and that these parental ego states can be activated under certain circumstances. Then every individual including children, mentally retarded individuals and schizophrenics is capable of objective data processing if the appropriate ego state can be activated so everyone's got an adult in them. And then thirdly that every individual is once younger than he or she is now and he or she carries inside of them fixed relics of the earlier years that will be activated under certain circumstances. So once again, everyone carries a little boy or girl around inside of them whenever they go, all the while being waiting to be activated by somebody pushing the right button. Or the wrong button. Or the wrong button. For instance, if, uh, if you imply that the other person is wrong, you're wrong about this, that's going to escalate it. And that's the parent coming out saying, you're wrong. If you uh, use language like selfish or lazy or idiot, uh, that's going to escalate things. It escalates things with me. Yeah. But then again, it doesn't because I'm well versed in ego states. Well, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I can't, I, Matt, I cannot imagine you calling your wife any of those things. Oh, absolutely not. She, no. She's none of those things. She would beat you up. Yes, she would. She'd shoot me. That's what she'd do. <laughs> so the same goes uh, with blame or insults, you know, criticism or say comparisons to you and some other idiot <laughs> so <laughs> you wouldn't want to do those sorts of things uh, because that will escalate it and and you know, so if we react in terms that are just wrong I mean and, and you know, we all kind of have a feel for what's right or wrong uh, when we're in a situation dealing with other people so uh, you know, it, it, it's sort of like rules, you know, our, our laws, our rules, our regulations, you know, these are all laws to keep us from getting in trouble. Uh, basically, the laws are there to keep us straight and keeping us from getting into conflicts with other people. I mean, if you start dumping a bunch of, of uh, oil down your uh, backyard and it drains into the neighbor's spot, that can get you in trouble, right? That's you right. Should, yeah. shouldn't do that. So you have to be careful not to do things that are just wrong. Uh, All right, Rick, we got, we got about two minutes left here. I want to bring up a point because we touched on it earlier. That's body language. I'm fanatical on body language. If I meet you two or three times for a course of 10 minutes to 30 minutes, three times, I've got you pretty much down, okay? Because things are going to come out. I'm going to learn your mannerisms, your inflections in your voice, your eyes, body stance, the whole works. I think this goes in excellent conjunction with learning the ego states. I would assume in court too, and I bring this up in court because God forbid one of us out there, LTC or something, uh, gets in trouble, since this is our LTC segment and attorney segment, I got to bring that in here. And you have to go to court for some reason, understanding body language on watching the threat and also if you're in the courtroom on how you handle yourself to show confidence. Wouldn't that be, those two things mesh up very well and be very important? Oh, oh absolutely. And you know, lawyers, guns, and money, I tend to want to think more in terms of the guns part, what we're here for today, de-escalating these conflicts that are, that are out in the street, 
where the other person might have the gun. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you wind up in the courtroom with lawyers and money, it's not that big a deal. <laughs> it's just really not that big a deal. <laughs> All right, Rich. Com compared to the other one, anyway.